Okay, um, good morning, everybody, and thank you all so much for coming. I think there's some of us still striving outside, but they'll come in. Um, so I just really want to wish you all a very warm welcome uh, to the first of three events, three five postal events on the <laughs> east coast and west coast to celebrate the life and legacy of the New Orleans Rail and by in January 2023. Primary corporate and I'll be chairing today's session which is scheduled for about two hours, but we actually have the room booked, I think, to one, so we're not going to be pushed out. Um, first thing I'd like to do at the outset is to thank some people, first of all, the new social justice speech, which actually provides the input for us to organize this event. And um, I want to thank Mark Arvin and Bill Murphy of ATU, at Manchester University, and Lini McNally, a good friend of Michal, for partnering with MU um, to put together the three program of events. But in particular, a very big thank you to Anne Hamilton Black of Boothie for her incredible event management skill. And thank you to ATU, MU Sociology, and MUSI, this is the building that we're in, the Social Science Institute, for their sponsorship and support of the event. So I don't know, there's refreshments available at, uh, in the kitchen, and we have a sort of a small little five minute break between the two sessions so you can run out and replenish uh, your coffee into then and there's toilets just outside the door and so um we're going to have two speakers and they're quite short 20 minutes and i'll be keeping a, an eye on the uh, time and uh, we're going to start with two speakers jane and uh, toby who will outline Michal's contribution to academia and to pathway social action and we might just have a little brief time for questions then. And then our second uh, two speakers, uh, Neil and uh, Martin, uh, will address the issue of the very live issue of prejudice and tolerance in Ireland today. And then we'll open up for a general participatory uh, discussion. Now, um, just before we begin, before I introduce the first speakers, I want to play you uh, a message that was sent from uh, Senator David Marr. Um, I asked if he'd like to come along, but his health didn't allow him, didn't allow him to come along, but he made a little video and said it was a lot, so I was going to play Hello, this is David Norris here. Uh, I'd like to add my contribution to the celebration of the life and work of Father Michal McGrail. Um, Michal McGrail was a remarkable man, and in many years before I started off, uh, Father McGrail published a book called Prejudice and Tolerance in Ireland, in which he found that a plurality of people thought that the laws against homosexuality were wrong. For that, I am deeply grateful. Thank you, Father Michal. Mm -hmm. That's a nice note to start to say. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jane Gray, Professor of Sociology at Duke University and a recent recipient of the incredibly prestigious European Research Council Advanced Research Award, which we're all incredibly thrilled about, and in all of Jane. And Jane is going to speak about Mihal's pioneering approach to social scientific inquiry. So we hope to use him. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> I was trying to explain so we found it to go because I think his, uh, his presentation might, in mine, might be a little bit, uh, maybe more sense after him, but uh, he's not cooperating. <laughs> when um, Mary asked me to, uh, to participate in the session, I felt it was important to you. I felt it was really important to recognize and acknowledge Mihal's work. But when I started to try to think about what I would talk about, I found myself a bit stumped. But I kept going back to a memory I had of me all in the park. And I think we were, maybe other people will remember this. Uh, we were trying to do something, we were trying to change the curriculum and we wanted to shake up the first year teaching. And I remember me all was very upset because as he saw, we were removing social psychology from the first year of teaching, and he felt that it was really important for first year uh, sociology students to learn something about social psychology. And I thought it was, it was interesting that he framed or thought about it that way, because I could understand 
why people might need to learn about norms and values and attitudes. But why was that something to do with social psychology? And when I was uh, listening to me all make his, make his case, it reminded me of an article that I had read some years before by uh, George Humans, which is, a, it was a, it was a fair speech that he made to the American Sociology Association, and it's quite fun to read. It's called Bringing Men Back In. Of course, in those days, men meant uh, men and women. Um, but uh, Holmes uh, was complaining quite a lot about the functional sociology that was dominant at the time. And he raised the question, and he pointed out that the structural functionalists were trying to take actions and agency out of sociology as he understood it. And he, uh, he went, he, uh, just a few quotes from this uh, article. He says, if there are norms, why do men conform to them? So far as the functionalists gave any answer to the question, it was that men had internalized the values embodied in the norm. But internalization is a word and not an explanation. He said, no matter what we say our theories are, when we seriously try to explain social phenomena by constructing even the various sketches of deductive systems, we find ourselves, in fact, and whether we admit it or not, using what I have called psychological explanations. I need hardly add that our actual explanations are our actual theories. So what Holmes was getting at, I think, is that people take action, and it's by understanding people's actions that we can explain things that are going on in the social world. It's not social roles that take actions, it's not social systems, but it's people. And Holmes and Volker have this wonderful expression, he says, that sociologists tend to be, um, uh, they get social psychological assumptions uh, out from under the table perfectly like a bottle of whiskey when they need to try to explain things because, you know, we don't refer to the structural functions in line with these social psychological ideas. So, given that uh, we all have emphasized the importance of following in that department meeting, I went back recently and looked at his uh, original edition of Ethics and Tolerance in Ireland. Now, one of the impressions that we have of Nepal is that he was a rank and pierce, but maybe somewhat justifiably. He's famous for not wanting to, not allowing his books to be published by commercial publishers because he wouldn't allow any of his tables to be edited. All of the data was valuable and all, and all of the tables had to be included. Uh, and of course, that didn't match normal publishing requirements. But what, so, so we think of the all as being this incredibly inclusive sociologist to get the data out there, you know, the data speak for themselves. But actually, in the first edition of Prejudice and Tolerance in Ireland, the entire first half of the book is taken up by Lee Hall's attempt to develop not just a theory of prejudice, but actually he veers into trying to develop a general theory of society. Um, he, want, he argues in this introductory section to his book that he, he's wanting to. Uh, excuse my, excuse my typo there. An interdisciplinary and cumulative model of uh, of social change, and I won't read it all out. But he develops this um, analysis where he says that there's a relationship between um, social psychology and social change, and and these um, these different domains interact within one with one another within uh, an understanding of society, which he called the momentum model of society. And this was Mihal's attempt to bring together, as he saw it, the sort of consensus model of society that we associate with people like Talcott Parsons and the structural functionalists and the American understanding of uh, the materialist tradition or the Marxist tradition, which yeah, I think Mihal was more, more influenced by this idea of the conflict model of society. And he called it the momentum model of society. And Mihal's account of momentum is this idea that social change occurs through a kind of oscillation between periods of stability and periods of crisis and rapid social change. Now, I'm, I'm not so. Trying to explain social change, though, is where I think Michal's imagination let him down, because I think in this first part, this first edition of Prejudice and Tolerance, and in the later editions, he never came back to try to do the same level of theorization. 
I think he is still beholden very much to structural functionalist ways of thinking. And he's even in the style, and it's really interesting for me, not me and most of us, we don't read this old stuff very much anymore. If you go back and read uh, Nicole's uh, chapters, it's written in this style where you try to develop an argument through the explanation of categories or concepts, and it can be quite turreted as an approach and a style. And of course, that's sort of inherited from the work of people like Parsons. And, and Nihal was quite um, emphatic about Parsons' idea that the problem for sociology is that the concepts that we use are also lay concepts. So something like prejudice has a very precise meaning in sociology from the old point of view, but it's, some, it's a word that is used in everyday language and everyday speech as well. So a large part of this first section of the book is a, an attempt to elaborate a, a theoretical argument through a very sort of painstaking elaboration of concept of categories. I thought it was quite interesting, his first quote, where he's he, he's definitely a very structural functionalist mood, irrespective of the remote causes of social change. The proximate cause is always the social system itself in its adaptation or adjustment to the pressures and counter pressures with pregnancy delivery. So that's not people, but then you all immediately switch to the new norms are institutionalized. People generally have poor choices open to them. So it becomes a question of agency. They either conform, they deviate, um, or they withdraw and opt out of effective social membership. So uh, uh, an interesting tension there, precisely as Holmes we described it, between, you know, when you're actually talking about what's happening and explaining what's going on, you're focusing on people's actions and choices, even though you're trying to argue with somebody acting phenomenon is the social system. And the second question, second quote here, a high level of social equilibrium can lead to long periods of stability and prosperity as long as it can maintain overall conformity. When, however, there is a significant level of social conflict, there is a greater sense of meaning and ideas of change and vision. And that really stood out to me. That's from the second edition of Prejudice and Talkers, the Prejudice in Ireland Revisited. And what really it struck me and aligned very much with the kind of work I'm trying to do with the ERC project is this point that it's at times of crisis that um, meaning breaks out, that people have to try to make sense of what's going on. Uh, and uh, this idea is very kind of consistent with sort of contemporary cultural sociological understandings of social change. And the work of notably people like Anne Swither who talk about how when everything's going along every day, we don't, we're not challenged in any particular way. We rely on habituated forms of action. And it's only when um, we are faced with a certain kind of level of crisis. And of course, we are surrounded by crises. We have been in recent years, and, and we still are perhaps, such as the pandemic, a very real crisis that we have to try to make sense and, and, and construct meaning. And, for some reason that I don't understand, and I wish he was here to ask him, we call it not not of the terms of quotation marks that he would speak in sort of things like uh, social, you know, very ordinary terms. Like, and, and I often, will, and as I was rereading this, I was wondering why did these terms ignore the quotation marks? What was it about them that we all thought was somehow dubious or imprecise? And so I'm not going to go on very much more. I just wanted to. I suppose the, the, the point that uh, about social psychology and, and socialization and old fashioned sociological concepts like norms and values is they fell out of favor. And the main reason in which they fell out of favor is because they were associated with the work of people like Talbot Parsons in the 1950s and 60s in particular, and became associated with a very sort of conservative understanding of society and social change. And it's interesting for me, just thinking about my own sort of where we were as a department and why we were not agreeing with Nihal and social psychology. I think it has to do with that rejection of that kind of language and those kinds of concepts associated with social functional And it also has to do with the ways in which um, we were all, not all of us, but many of us were thinking about the importance of culture in this social change at the time. So 
Um, Holmans, so I'm coming back to Holmans, he's in one of the ways in which he makes his sort of snarky point about social psychology is he criticizes the very thing that Paul Neil Smelter about the Industrial Revolution. And so when Smelter actually gets down to it and tries to explain what's happening, he says, what do we hear of? We hear of dissatisfaction and emotional reactions, aspiration, and what feels these things is a role dissatisfied or emotional. No, Smelter himself says it's various elements of the population which is so under relentless pressure. Let us finally confess that various elements of the population, again, almost use the word men, but we can say people. Um, and I suppose it was, but for me, you know, when I think of social psychology, I don't really think of emotions and feelings and aspirations. That's not how I, I'm sorry if there are psychologists in the room, but that's not why. So that's not why at the time I associated psychology with. So that I associated much more with history and the new social historians, people like E.P. Thompson, the idea that, you know, we understand cultural ch and social change by how people use their existing cultural knowledge to interpret and adapt, and adapt to changing experiences. But, and, and this uh, is my last <laughs> slide though. What seems to have happened in recent sociology? We all have socialization and values and attitudes are having are certain. Um, part of the reason uh, is uh, was put forward by um, Jeff Gouin and his colleagues in an article in the Annual Sociological Review, where he says that a little bit like what Holman said about structural functionalism, those of us who are interested in social history and cultural change and the new cultural sociology also tend to bring socialization back out like that bottle of whiskey that Holmans talks about. Because how do we understand how people become habituated to certain cultural, how do people become acculturated? Even the idea that we're due to propose that somehow uh, our dispositions that become parts of our bodily engagement in the world, where, how does that happen? Some, something must be going on through which people Acquire through which our the structure of our personalities are, are affected uh, by culture. And so we see the revival of um, ideas about socialization, uh, and we see the re emergence in the thoughts by Andrew Miles about how we need to bring values back in, work by Boris about attitudes, uh, and a lot of um, interesting ideas emerging from new. Um, dual process of cognition, which sociologists have you know, brought in from neuroscience and psychology, and, and some people suggest without not really fully understanding it, probably that would be a, 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 a thing that would be typical of sociologists as well. So the idea is, um, and I suppose that's the final point that I'm trying to make about people and social psychology. And if we go back, and, and there's a, you know, the way in which he the way in which he was struggling in that first edition of Prejudice and Tolerance to, to, with some of these ideas about socialization and action. Where do, I suppose many of you are probably interested in you know, attitudes of prejudice, which is after all what we all is famous for. But the question at the end of the day is how do those attitudes become part of who we are? That's the process, uh, the social psychological and sociological. So what, uh, just one or two observations before I finish. Um, another, if I had written a different presentation and I hadn't got distracted with these ideas of socialization, I might have pointed out the importance of Nicole's work as a kind of bridge, I think, part of a series of studies that, that can be understood as a kind of bridge linking you know, the anthropological lens on Ireland that we inherit from Aaronsberg and Kimball. And what John Goldthorpe thinks we call the sociology of the institutes, you know, the, the quantitative research carried out by the Economic and Social Research Institute. And I think more significantly, in recent times, the turn towards sort of major international surveys as sources of information about values and attitudes. Nobody, I don't think anybody would do, and only all would like us to do, but I don't think anybody would do the kind of survey that we all did uh, anymore because we have things like the European Social Survey, European Values Survey, uh, and so on, where we can get um, high, reasonably high standard data that allows us to make comparisons very importantly between Ireland and other countries. 
But I think there are a whole series of studies like prejudice intolerance, like um, um, John Jackson's study of social mobility, I was trying to think of, of other ones, uh, study of social capital in form, the Betty Hilliard study of conception preference, so lots of studies that were carried out sort of in between the emergence of these big omnibus, you know, the modern kind of uh, approach to understanding values and attitudes and the anthropological lens. And I think it, it's, it would be ideal to do what we all wanted to do, which is to be able to reuse the data that were collected in those studies to try to understand that period of Irish social change, asking new questions of the data. And now me, I know that we all states at the end of Prejudice and College in Ireland that the data were all on tapes of some form and can be used by others, subject to copyright restrictions. Be very careful to, to add. But where are they? Does anybody know? It would it be possible to access those tapes? And of course, this is all a kind of reminder, as my husband would point out, that books and paper are more durable than digital <laughs> uh, media. And so we really need to make uh, a, a conscious effort to try to re preserve these kinds of data because they're really uh, valuable. So there's a, a risk, I would say, that the sociological evidence on this period of Irish history will be lost. So thank you very much. Sorry to all. I'm delighted to introduce our um, esteemed former colleague. Um, professor Tony Fadi. Fadi is Professor Emeritus at UCD and also previously a senior researcher at the SRI. And before that, Tony was a colleague of mine in Maynooth and of Michals. And before that, I think you were a student. So you still look like a schoolboy, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, we're delighted to have Tony here today. He's going to speak again about putting Michal in a little bit of context. Yes. Uh, Seats up at the front of anyone yeah. can go. Thank you very much, Mary. And thank you indeed yeah. for... for I, I don't know who is mainly responsible for this event, but whoever it is, and I know Mary was central to it, thank you indeed for doing it. It's a very worthwhile and important marker of uh, a man who's a very significant figure in Irish sociology and in Irish public life over a very long time. Now, my qualification for being here is that I arrived into Minute in October 1970 as a first year undergraduate student. I was one of the first intake of lay students uh, to come into the, what was the, then the National Seminary, after the opening up of the seminary to the external world that happened. It happened first in 1966, when people in higher diploma in education, in other words, trainee teachers were taken in, taken in, but then opened to undergraduates in 1968. By the time I arrived in 1970, the numbers were still very small. Free secondary education had only just been introduced the previous year, mm -hmm. so that that supply of students, there simply wasn't the demand for first level education nationally at the time. But I arrived in 1970, and when I did, in the sociology department, Liam Ryan, Professor Liam Ryan, was the department entirely on, on his own. He got the entire program from beginning to end. Now, he uh, achieved a very quick 100% increase in the numbers in the department uh, a year later when the Hall McGrail came along. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, a further increase the year after, I think Michelle Payon came along, and it remained at that three for, I think I joined the department in 1987, and I think there were still only three of them in 1987 when I came back as a, as a, as a member of the department. So uh, one of the features of the situation that I arrived into in the news was that nearly all of the teaching staff then were priests, and of course in Liam Ryan was a priest and Neil McGray was a priest. Now, the context for today's event is, is this interest in social justice. It's Social Justice Week. And so uh, what I said I would talk about was the Catholic Social Justice Movement and Michal McGrail's uh, role in it. Now, the Catholic Social Justice Movement is a very broad-based movement that emerged in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, probably more inspired not by so much by the Council itself, but by the encyclical published by Pope Paul VI in 1967, namely, 
public law and progressive law, which is about the role of development. It was largely about the justice between the rich world and the poor, poor world, but also concerned with rectifying problems of poverty and injustice in, within rich countries. Um, uh, now, I, I think Michal is, a, is, a, is an interesting figure in, in this movement because in some ways he absolutely embraced the Catholic social justice movement. And one of the reasons we remember it so well is the, the wide number of causes that he took. In 1968 or 69, he, for example, he lived for a year on the side of the road with travellers. Uh, along with another Jesuit priest, they got their own caravan and lived along with travellers incognito, in the sense that <laughs> the travellers knew that they weren't travellers, but the idea was that nobody else would be hoping. Uh, and so he threw himself all heartily in the cause of like that. Travellers, prisoners was another big issue. When I was here as an undergraduate, one of his book was uh, the bees he had in his bonnet was about widows' pensions. Um, and so there was a wide diversity of causes that he took up. And when he took them up, he really did. He really took them up. <laughs> Somebody tell me to stop. So um, so he embraced it in one sense, but I think in another way, he was, he was, he, he, there was toward another side to his in the record, he remained a very devout Catholic. He was a priest, and in fact, not only was he a priest, he was a Jesuit. And between the two things together, uh, um, and, and the way he lived out uh, that, that his, his, his Jesuit life, and I think he lived his Jesuit life right up to the end. Uh, the, the way he combined those two in his life, it, it, it was, in certain sense, it was unusual. I'd say there was a certain ambivalence there, and I, and I want to trying to spell out exactly what I mean by that in ambivalence. Uh, but at the same time, he was wholehearted on both sides of the ambivalence, if you want to you know what I mean. He was, he was fully committed to each side, even though there weren't, and, and, and he kind of, in my view, he sort of su almost suppressed the tensions that were there between them. Now, just a bit of context for us to say something about his biography. He was born in 1931, uh, the second of a family of six siblings. Uh, he, uh, his father, uh, had, uh, when he was born, his father was a what you might call a forester. He was a manager, a local, a regional manager for a, a Scottish lumber company that owned forest tracts of forestry in the Midlands and the Lands of Ireland. So, so somehow he lived in County Leash and in County Galway until he was a six-year-old. And then his father bought a small farm, or no, he didn't buy a small farm. He returned to the home place in Loch Loon, uh, just outside of Westport. And his father later added another, uh, bought another place, which, we, which he added to the original book with a bigger house. They moved to Drummondu, uh, just west of Westport. Uh, so there weren't actually, there were, he, he always referred to himself as a child of the hill farms in, the, in, in West Bay, Mayo, which, to some, which was true, certainly. But it was, he was, it was probably slightly better off than the average, which isn't saying much because the general standard of it was a pretty smart life. But one of the interesting things about him is that all of the six siblings completed their secondary education, which is quite an unusual thing in, uh, in uh, that part of rural Ireland or any part of rural Ireland time. Now, that was partly due to the presence of a convent of mercy and a Christian brother school in Westport. So he was a Christian brother's boy. He did his leaving cert with Christian brothers in 1958, or sorry, in 1948. Uh, he after 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 um, after um, his leaving cert, he for a time dabbled in the motor trade of all things. He got an apprentice, or he got a job at a car sales showroom in Dublin. <laughs> but he quite quickly uh, entered the army cadets. His older brother Sean, he was the second. His older brother Sean had become an army uh, cadet uh, a couple of years previously, and so he followed them into the army in. Uh, 1950s, as far as I remember, within two years he had come out of the uh, cadet school and became the first of the, the, the lieutenant in the army. And he was promoted to second lieutenant. And it was in 1958 when he was about, he was 28 or 29 before he decided to go to the religious side. Now, of his siblings, three of the six siblings went into the religious side. His younger brother Owen became an outlet policeman, and his younger sister Mary became a, a Saint Louis sister. So, three out of the six in the religious side. We give us some sense of, of kind of intensity of religious uh, upbringing that they had. Now, one of, the, one of the surprises you might say in that history is that he became a Jesuit. 
Uh, it is not common in the Jesuits for Christian brothers and boys from my sport <laughs> to uh, enter uh, that order. In the hierarchy, and there was a very well-defined hierarchy among the religious congregations at the time, actually empirically analyzed by no other, no, 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 no less a figure than Jeremiah Newman, who was president of the Manu at that time. Uh, I was here in a very sophisticated study of vocations patterns in the late 1950s and brought out this hierarchy between, say, the Jesuits, Franciscans, and Dominicans, who were there to educate the, the, um, the professional classes, if you like. Then there was the likes of, the, say, the, the Mercy Sisters, uh, the diocesan colleges, the diocesan uh, minor seminaries that were there for the kind of the middle range, and then the Christian brothers down at the bottom. Uh, the sort of lower middle class and working class, upper working class, you might say. So it, would, it, it was unusual in class terms for Michal to become Jesuit. And I think the explanation for his arrival into the Jesuits that in his time in the Quran, uh, he'd, he, he, his first social cause of life, the Irish language, his mother was an O'Connor from Connemara. He used to spend his childhood summers in Connemara with his grandmother, who was a native Irish speaker. And it was there that he picked up his, his Irish. And in his time in the army camp, or he devoted a lot of his energies to the promotion of the Irish language, which, of course, was a thing that was looked on with great favor in the army. Right? And there were Jesuits from the uh, Jesuit uh, novitiate in Rahan in Tullamore, possibly also from Congos, who regularly came to the uh, army camp in the in connection with Irish language events. And it seems to be there that he made contact with the Jesuits. And when he applied, he says in his memoirs, and I had known this before, when he applied to the Jesuits, he had applied to a number of different places to, to join up. Uh, he said that the Jesuits, when he had, he had the, the, um, an interview with the provincial of the Jesuits, and the, the interview was conducted in Irish, and that that was actually, I think, one of the major reasons why you know, they accepted him, of course. And I don't think he would have, had he gone straight after city school, I doubt he would have ended up with the Jesuits. It was the to remember in the army that enabled him to enter the Jesuits. So uh, he was very influenced by his aunt, who was also known as St. Louis' sister. Uh, and uh, he, so he, he joined the Jesuits in 1959 at the age of 28. And he was, it, he was ordained 10 years later in 1969. Now, the Jesuits, things worked. Thinking a bit about the Jesuits in Ireland and their role in Irish life, and, and you might think it kind of surprising given their association with elite education and the, the sort of the highbrow end of Catholic culture in Irish life, that he ended up uh, in the Jesuits or identifying so strongly with them. But it's worth recalling that, and of course we think of, you know, Belvedere, Gonzaga, Clangos, Mungrish uh, uh, in, in education. But also social uh, studies, the magazine studies, the journal studies founded in 1918, which was a kind of a forum for reasonably highbrow intellectual discussions about issues in Irish life over the course of the 20th century. But there was another side to the Jesuit presence in Irish life, which I think it affected me all quite strongly. And this was uh, when it, it, one way to, to this is the, uh, I don't know how many people here will remember the messenger. You know, yes. Now the messenger, the messenger was a was a, a Catholic uh, periodical, uh, which was the model was invented or developed in the eighteen forties of Jesuits in Lyon. Uh, and by the end of the the, the messenger, now it was called the Irish Messenger of the Sacred Heart. It was printed. It was it was published by the Jesuits, and so the Jesuits actually entered every home in Ireland through the Irish Messenger. Not every home. I think at its peak circulation in the 1940s and 1950s, it had uh, it was issued about 250 or 300 thousand copies. So uh, it was one of the biggest circulation magazines in Ireland at the time, uh, and it was centered on the cult of the Sacred Heart, the adoration of the Sacred Heart, the Irish Messenger of the Sacred Heart, and and it was called the Irish Messenger of the Sacred Heart because the, there were messengers in nearly most Catholic regions of the world. You know, it was a Jesuit. Model of the ideas were being replicated. I think at one point I saw that there were 52 different editions, national editions of the Messenger in play by the end of the 1800s. 
Uh, and uh, it was founded in Ireland in 1888 by Father James Cullen, a Jesuit priest, and the head of art in Lisa Street, where it's still is headquartered, and it still is put regularly. And I permitted to have a circulation of 25 to 30 thousand still. It is still one of the largest circulation periodicals in Ireland. <laughs> uh, now, Father James Cullen then, in, in 1888, in, in 1898, he also developed what was another major insertion of the Jesuits in that Irish life through the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association. Now, the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association is defined as an apostolate of the Society of Jesus, which is under the patronage of the Irish Episcopal Conference. It was, it was devoted, it, it's, its social purpose was to combat alcohol. It was a temperance movement. But it was a temperance movement that was highly uh, spiritualized, or it, it, it was, it, in fact, it, it veered between, on the one hand, presenting it as a temperance movement, and on the other hand, between presenting it as a form of veneration of the sacred heart. It was, you know, the, the, those of you who remember the pioneer pin will recall that. At the head of the pin was a representation of the same part. Mihal was that one. And Mihal wore one right up all his life. Uh, and so the veneration of the Sacred Heart again became one of the most popular of the popular devotions. And it was a Jesuit intervention. Now, I must say, I, I, only, I only discovered about 10 years ago that all of this had a Jesuit origin. But it did bring the Jesuits into Irish life. And when Michal was in the army camp in the Kura one, and in fact, I suspect, like all of us in my time, I was confirmed it was routine to take the pledge mm -hmm. and, and get your pioneer in. And I think those, the, the idea was that it was a junior version, and we were supposed to, we were supposed to replicate it when you were 18 for, for life. Uh, but uh, he probably, I doubt he ever uh, deviated from the time of his confirmation. And he was, certainly, he was certainly an outsider to some degree, in the army camp and the Kura in not being a dreamer. Uh, and he persisted uh, with the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association. And I'm actually going to say a bit about that, because I think it tells you uh, uh, something about uh, uh, In the short time I have here, uh, we could talk about his work with the itinerants or the, the travelers, with the prisoners or the various social campaigns. But I think it's we need to also to keep the other side in mind. The other side is easy to forget. Uh, he, so he, he remained a, a very enthusiastic pioneer all his life. And he, he, in his memoirs, he recounts that at the time when he was in uh, University of Michigan, in Ann Arbor in 1976, when he was finishing his PhD, uh, he became, he, he, there was, was chapters of the pioneers all over North America. Nearly all of them, in fact, not only nearly all, they were all Irish diaspora uh, uh, organizations. And he, he was there and he became interested in the circumstances of the American Indians, the, Amer the Native Americans. And of course, one of the big problems of the Native Americans was uh, alcohol. And he tried to persuade the local chapter of the pioneers in Ann Arbor to mount a campaign among the Native Americans to make, to make pioneers of them. And so, now, the, 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 the issue there, the, the, there, there, is, there is an issue there because, of course, if you interpret the ideas as a temperance movement, that was a very worthy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But if you interpret it as a, as a, as a veneration of the sacred heart, as, a, as an other little Catholic, mm -hmm. an expression of Catholic spirituality, then it becomes somewhat different. Uh, and, you know, there is the prayer, there is a prayer of what I think is called the heroic offering mm -hmm. that pioneers are supposed to utter. Every yeah. day or every week, where they're rededicating themselves uh, to the sacred heart and to a, to a life that's uh, it was a kind of an, an expression of Christian asceticism, as much as a social mission to combat the evils of alcohol. So it was a it was a combined exercise in that regard. Now, in 1991, Michal really then he, he, he had been a keen pioneer all his life, but in 1991, the Jesuits asked him to become chair. A chairperson of the board of management, which is really the operating uh, the chair of the board of the of the uh, pioneers, which he did in 1981, and in fact, I would say that from 1991 until about uh, for the next 17 or 18 years, I'd say the pioneers occupied more of his energies than most other things. Uh, he uh, the, the the first big uh, first big event that he uh, was engaged in was, to, in fact, the reason they asked him to take over 
was to organize the centenary celebrations of pioneers, which took place in 1998 in Cole Park. This is 100 years after James Cullen And so he ran that. And, uh, and it was a huge occasion. Cole Park gave them the venue for nothing. <laughs> as, and as he says, they did a Cole Park was also the venue for the, the 50th uh, anniversary celebrations and the 60th uh, celebrations in 49 and 59. Uh, and it was quite a, it was quite a large, it was 45,000 people present in 1998. Now in 1998, you get 45,000 people to turn on. It was huge contingents of bishops and clergy in both from around the world and in Ireland. So it was a major occasion. And, and of course, it was, a, it was a major organizational challenge. Now he, he continued for 16 years as, as chair of the pioneers. And in the early 2000s, now as he mentions in his memoirs in, the, in, the, in 2004, one of the successes of the pioneers in Ireland was they had spread quite widely in Africa. And he decided, you know, again, that he was a man of prodigious energy. And so when he decided to take something up, he really did take it up. And I just want to read you the list of countries, which I have written down here somewhere, Pioneers were, had, had organizations in Kenya, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Tanzania, Namibia, South Africa, and Nigeria. And in 2004, he decided he was going to visit the mall. <laughs> so he set out and he spent, he spent uh, two and a half months on the road going to all of these countries, visiting every country. He said he had 100 meetings uh, and uh, wrote reports and kept up correspondence with them all. Two years later, when he, he, he had been renewed as, as chairman of the Pioneers of Total Abstinence Association, he decided that he was going to visit that they had a thousand branches, 1,077 branches in Ireland. He decided that he was going to visit everyone. <laughs> and he set out to do it in February 2006. And uh, he says in his memoirs, I failed. I only visited 994. Oh. And he wrote a report for every single one. Now, uh, I, I would just say that this question of Mary has just flagged, told me to, to wind up. And, and, and of course, I could talk about him all for quite a, a long time. But uh, uh, one, of, one of his reservations about the Second Vatican Council was that in the Second Vatican Council, the really Second Vatican Council turned against this kind of Catholic activism. It was felt actually that the devotion to the Sacred Heart. They didn't, there were some Catholics who, who are almost not quite idolatrous, but certainly that it cut across the centrality of the Mass as the core, uh, as the core of the Catholic sacramental love. And the people who were getting distracted with all these ancillary devotions and paying too little attention to the core business of the Mass. And he did not like that. And he, he, he had this attachment and fascinated fascination with the religiosity of the, of, that he grew up with. And it's quite clear, again, from the way he lived his life, that this religiosity was quite strong to the fore. Now, in, 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 on the other side then, in 1960, in 1965, I think a major turning point was, you know, when he joined the Jesuits, they were not known for their commitment to social justice. Mm -hmm. But in 1965, Pedro Arupe, the 31st general conference of the uh, uh, Pedro Arupe was elected the uh, Superior General of the International Jesuits. Now, he's been regarded as part of the second Ignatius Loyola, uh, the second founder of the organization, and he firmly directed it onto the path of social justice. And, the, uh, and, and then between that and the next general conference, which took place in 1974, they totally absorbed the uh, implications of Vatican II in it are interpreted Vatican II in a very strong social justice direction. And the um, the, uh, the, uh, the the resolution that often quoted from that uh, um, uh, uh, conference in 1974 is the mission of the Society of Jesus today is the service of faith, of which the promotion of justice is an absolute requirement. For reconciliation with God demands the reconciliation of people with one another. Now, uh, in, in, you, you can interpret this in a number of different ways, but in, in, 
I think they I think it is fair to say that there is a there is a very powerful inherent tension between in that foundation of a religious uh, mission. On the one hand, service of the faith is the mission. But on the other hand, reconciliation of all peoples with each other. He isn't saying you reconcile with your Catholic neighbor if you have a falling out. He's saying you must reconcile with people of no faith. He himself, Arupe, had uh, served his early years as a judge in Japan. And in fact, he was in Hiroshima the day the bomb dropped. And the Jesuit novitiate was separated from the bomb site by Hiva. Otherwise, the whole, all the Jesuit community would have been wiped out, including himself. And he was very conscious of this idea that, that Christianity is only one among a group of, of religious faiths in the world. And in fact, increasingly, there are people in North. But that Christianity had to reconcile itself with people of no faith and not claim, as the church had done in the years before them, and its mission was to bring people to the faith. Now, uh, this, is, this is what interests me about the history of what has happened, not just in the case of Mihal, but I want to stop uh, uh, not just in Mihal's case, but in the case of the, of the history of, of, of religiosity. My view that what happened in the social justice movement is that Catholic ethics became secularized. Mm -hmm. And that the mission that uh, the social justice movement took on at the time was human improvement, human flourishing in this worldly terms as an objective of the religious life that could be taken up, taken away from uh, the any concerns about the next life. And also that the traditional view, that the, the traditional Catholic view of morality until the Second Vatican comes with that moral acts were those which uh, guided us to eternal life. That an act was moral. If it brought us closer to God and, and, and closer, closer to eternal life. But in the post Vatican world, um, an act was moral if it helped repair injuries that had been done to other people. And when you consider that some of those injuries were done in the name of faith, that in itself became a, a serious issue. And it meant that the boundaries of faith, this Max Weber in, always says that in, in the sociology of church, that it is a, that a community of faith, that in any community, boundedness is, is an essential feature, and that in the Catholic tradition, this, this dictum of ex re ecclesiam nulla salutis, outside of the church, there is no salvation, that that got diluted very radically among the Jesuits, I would say, more than in any other re religious congregation in the Catholic world, in the Arupe uh, period. And that, and in fact, that. That lack of boundedness has been part of the story of religious decline in the years since then. So anyway, I don't stop with that. Yeah. 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 I think we have about five minutes that we can just pause. And if anybody wants to ask Jane or Sonia a question, or if you want to make a comment at this point, um, yeah. And then we'll actually move on to our second session, which is really trying to locate Mihal, if you like, ideas in the contemporary context. So um, I'll just do five minutes, and then we will have more time to ask more questions at the end. So, um, sorry, yourself there. If you want to say your name, and I'm Ego I'm Secretary oh, of the Archives Council. I just want to pick up uh, the ambition there, Tom, in your overall presentation. And now that he's role as a trade unionist, he was a shop steward for a fight book in this building. Mm -hmm. He participated in the academic strike of 1977. Mm -hmm. And I met him in 1981 when the Calair Trades Council was formed. And he came into my office. I was put on trade for the UNPG of the EU. And I told him he was in the wrong office, in the car, <laughs> down the road. <laughs> Throughout the entire period that I knew, which was for the next 20 years, he was one of the most committed trade union activists. Not trade union to the ideology or the principles of it, 
but he was an he was an activist. He he, he worked with me to set up the Clare Trades Council in Clare, to set up the resource centres, to set up education, and in fact opened this university to the training and movement for our conferences, for our meetings, uh, etc. But he was unique in one characteristic. He was the only priest that I know of that was a delegate to the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And mm -hmm. um, went to the, to the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, stood up in 1987 and advocated on the, on, uh, for the acceptance of the program for national recovery to create an inclusive society around, around trade unionism. But three years ago, uh, I was asked to re re reform the Canary Trades Council, and I sent an invitation to him in Mayo. And he came up, and he, 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 he wasn't in the best act. Hmm. To advocate, to advocate that no employer should have the veto on, on trade union recognition, on the collectivization of uh, workers. And he, he cemented his whole concept of justice and fairness in the rights of everyone. And it was a tremendous tribute to, to me when I last, last met him to, to realize that right up to the end, he was the, a foremost articulate advocate of trade union rights. And I think that a mere minute, it should be recorded that this is where he was a shop steward. Thank you. Very much for reminding us of that. Yes, yeah. we, we were all corralled by people <laughs> to the union. I can assure you, day one of admission to the uh, university. Um, would anybody else like to make a comment or ask a question or a clarification? If, yeah, uh, Owen. Oh, yeah. Murphy, uh, just a question to you both, actually. Do you think the contradictions in hearing in Horton's theory and how he lived up, lived out his life on this, I suppose, his different dedications, add us to his? Uh, are some way ending that. challenging. Well, I think contradiction is also always generative when it comes to ideas. And but I think if Michal was here, he would completely deny it. Mm -hmm. But knowing him as a person, he wouldn't accept for a minute that uh, there was that. I would you agree, Tony, that there was anything uh, yeah, contradictory? It certainly didn't hold him back. Yes. Um, and and doubt was never uh, exactly. a thing that uh, he entertained. You know, he, no. he, he he was a he had a kind of a steamroller approach. Once he once he decided to go at something, it, the idea was to kind of uh, storm through it. And and actually, in some ways, he, he I, I must say, I found it, he had, he had really no interest. He was a, even though he was a Jesuit and a priest, he had very little interest in theology. And a lot of the the tensions which arose here in Manute. Actually, Manute was a very interesting center of theological conflict in his mm -hmm. time. And indeed, some of his fellow trade unionists in Manute, Enda McDonough was chair of IFOOT for, for a while. He was professor of moral theology here. Now, uh, they, were, they were riven with conflict over fundamental theological questions, not least about the nature of morality. And uh, Michal didn't worry about the nature of morality in, in any general intellectual sense. He just said, some things are wrong and we must tackle them. Now, if some things are wrong, uh, then there's all sorts of implications. Now, there was a lot of other things that he steered widely clear of. You know, the, one of the big sources of theological conflict at the time was Humanae Vitae in 1968, 67, 68. And I, I, I've never heard him or seen anything that he's never mentioned. Uh, and, and so there were, there, were, there were some issues that were roiling the society at the time, and particularly roiling religion, that he did not uh, didn't go there. Yeah. He didn't go there. But, he, he but I, it, but yeah. I, and I think that, that's just to answer that, that that was, you know, he went, he went for things that he had 100% confidence in. He avoided things where there was uncertainty. And there was a lot of those things in the Catholic world where there was uncertainties. And, and in a way, that was how he 
that 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 enabled them to be hugely energetic. And I can certainly recall, I remember sitting here in Maynooth in my early days, stuffing envelopes for the Academic Staff Association ahead of the meeting. He, he, he was a great man for roping people. You know, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so. Okay, so you're going to take one more comment and then we're going to move on to our second set of speakers. So, yeah, yeah. 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 I just want to know how you guys, as we've seen Tony my former lecture here, he seems to be interconnected with being a, a voracious campaigner and a politician in small field. Mm-hmm. We were so stuck into getting the new full blown university status and not token constituent status. The transcript in the High Court case when he was a witness for David Norris seeking decriminalization of homosexuality. I just, just he, he did so much. I was in his office one day and um, a minister rang him and we were annoyed with him because he went over to the government and we were to the commission to make sure the tracks were not lifted from Sligo. No. 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 just so much. I remember asking men if I was time with the travelling community and I said, did they not really they make you one of them? Oh, I'll provide it. forgot all about it. Mm-hmm. You know, so I just want to know, there's a politician there as well, I mm-hmm. believe. And, uh, Huge campaigner, and the, that, that drive the sociology of the, of us the other way around. I, I just think um, mm-hmm. he was a, a once all incredibly generous yeah. figure, yeah. And um, he was so proud that uh, he got Ewart Biggs Award on his French tolerance, yeah, movie. yeah. And that caused consternation in Conor Gay at the time because that a good charity was shot before he died, and he was nearly ostracized by some for accepting the award. He was unapologetic about that, and he's been proven to be correct. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that, Evan. Um, so I think we'll actually move on. Um, and Martin, oh, there you are. You're fighting down high. So we have two uh, speakers now, and um, both are very integrally connected with Maynooth University. Uh, Martin Collins. Founding member of Abbey Point uh, Traveller and Roman Centre, of which he's the co director. And Martin has represented our travellers in many different contexts. And we also have Neil MacDonald, graduate of New University and the director of the Hope and Courage Collective. And I think Neil's work is very much taken up now with um, dealing with the uh, emergent fascist and far right groups, in particular, you know, the, the creation of a narrative of the other. That includes not just travellers, but people seeking asylum, Irish people of colour, Irish minoritized groups, LGBTQIA, and so on. So uh, we're, we're really going to shift focus to looking at what's actually going on in our society today and perhaps reflect on what insights that we can get from that. So, Martin, if I could just hand over to you first. Okay. Um, thank you very much, and uh, it's uh, it's great to be here uh, as part of Social Justice Week, and in particular for this event to commemorate and and acknowledge and pay tribute to Michael McGrail and the fantastic work that he did over many uh, decades in in developing an, an analysis around prejudice and intolerance and 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 racism. And just before maybe I delve a bit further into that. Uh, I don't know if people believe in the six degrees of separation, but I don't think that applies in an Irish context. I would suggest, respectfully, it's probably two degrees of separation. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is, uh, as a young fella, on my mother's side, the McDonald's, uh, they all live in Mullingar, with me. Uh, my father's side would be from Aidenberry County Offaly. <laughs> but this office would be our road to Mullingar. And I remember as a young fella, going on with me, mother and father, and uh, in the back of the van, control in the back of the van, and you'd pass this university obviously every single day, and uh, every single trip. And little did I realize at the time that there were many individuals on different paths in their lives that at some stage would converge and meet each other and have an association with each other. Uh, never expected that. And those people would be, um, for example, Anastasia Pukki, 
who was the former head of the Department of Applied Social Studies, who was absolutely instrumental and a trailblazer in creating the conditions where underrepresented groups, and in particular my own community, got a chance to go to higher education and get their degrees and diplomas and so forth. And then, of course, my partner, uh, John McConnell, uh, a Columban priest uh, and a founding member of Happy Point Chapel and Roman Centre. And there's a building here or a room named after, after John as well. And then, of course, uh, Michal the Blade and his work and his writings on, on, on travel. Um, I, I missed Michal a few times, but the first time I met him actually was about 20 years ago, and it was totally unexpected. I, I heard of him, uh, I knew to an extent some of his work. I wouldn't say I was overly familiar. Um, but it was a very uh, peculiar uh, encounter. Myself and Ronnie Fay in our restaurant. Ronnie was the co director of Pavi Point for 15 years, and I'm myself. We were both walking past the GPO on a December evening. It was around 10 o'clock. And I didn't see him, and Ronnie did. And she says, Go on, go on, go on, talk and have a chat with And I did. Uh, I went over and I, I accosted me all, and uh, I don't know what he met of me. Or what he was thinking, but I just had a chat with him and just commended him on, on his work and for his analysis around uh, travel issues and what he and so forth. And we had, had a, a brief chat, and then I met him a few times after that. Mm -hmm. And I was at the launch of, uh, of uh, this publication, The Emancipation of the Traveling People, uh, which he obviously uh, put together and forwarded by Chris Bud, uh, ex uh, TD, and ex government uh, minister. Um, the report itself, when you read it, it's actually really is groundbreaking. It really is uh, pioneering. And it's very hard to He didn't hold back. For example, some of the terminology in it, he talks about the informal apartheid, ending the informal apartheid. Mm -hmm. And in that, there's an implicit recognition that the racism and discrimination just wasn't at the individual level. Mm -hmm. It was structural. It was instituted, and that was really, really, as I said, uh, groundbreaking. He spoke about indigenous ethnic group. Really, really, you know, interesting and very, very helpful language from our perspective in Happy Point and in the wider travel in, in the wider travel movement. And he spoke about ethnic cleansing. You know, so as I say, he didn't hold back. You know, he really went, you know, far. Uh, and that language was really important to Abbey Point Travel and Roma Centre and very important to other travel organisations, local and national. Because from 1985 onwards, the establishment of Dublin Travel Education and Development Group, subsequently to become Abbey Point Travel and Roma Centre, we were developing that analysis around human rights, around social justice, uh, about challenging the, the racist ideology that we have failed set of people, misfits. From the town who need to be civilized, normalized, and rehabilitated by saved by the set of people as well. That was the racist ideology that prevailed for years. And we tried to challenge that from 1985 onwards. And then for this report we published in 2010, effectively reinforcing our analysis and about reframing power issues and power concerns from a subcultural poverty. Failed set of people to one of framing it in terms of human rights and racism in the experience of travel. So it was extremely powerful and helpful uh, from that from that point from that point of view. Um, and it is the case that well, not just over the decades, but over the centuries, from back as far as uh, George Boros, there's been a lot of academics linguists, anthropologists, sociologists, and others who have, how would you say, entered or accessed our community and have researched, we've been probably researched at nausea at this stage, you know, yeah. really bit of fatigue setting in, you know. And, but not all of these academics, what they did was, was, was actually not beneficial, but the opposite, it's actually very harmful to travel and reinforce those 
racist ideology that failed set of people that needed to be civilized and normalized. And uh, you know, and it certainly would not put me on the ground that country. But I just want to make that point that academics are not value free either. You know, and they do carry, you know, their own values and beliefs to the work that they do. And, and sometimes we see the manifestations of that in their output in terms of their mm-hmm. books and other other uh, resources that might produce. Um, and uh, I, I'm actually quite struck as well. I find it interesting, you know, that we all would have spent a couple of months in 1968 or, ni- or 1969, whatever, a couple of weeks or a month, whatever it was, each time, spinning with travel. And uh, I, 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 I would love to be there because I can only imagine, uh, <laughs> I can only imagine in crap in the bank, the travel will have a big you know. Uh, because we as a people collectively, and this is not a pigeon border stereotype, but we are, as, as a collective, we, we do, you know, we like that bit of pride, we like that bit of banter, and take, yes. take it to piss on people, essentially. Uh, mm-hmm. I can imagine that's what happened to me, Hall. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. And, uh, and I'm also reminded of another uh, sociologist, who actually was excellent as well, an English sociologist, Jude Lowe, who uh, done a lot of research on the the moment. And we invited her, we invited Jules back to have a for a conference one time. And one of the things that I remember quite vividly from that conference was that she doesn't really know if her research stands up. Because she says that after a long period of time on reflection, she felt that having interviewed travelers, Roman gypsies, primarily in the UK, she felt, and this whole words, you left with your ignorance intact. <laughs> you know, so anyway, I, I, I just I just thought that was really interesting. I, I said, I would like to be there. Uh, John O'Connell was a Columbian priest, as I said a moment ago, and he worked in the Philippines for over 20 years before he came out of Ireland in 1983, and then started um, taking interest in, in the work with travelers. And God was you know, likes to be called very pioneering in his approach and in his analysis. You know, one was around self determination, lack of participation, you know, based on the premise that no significant or sustainable change can happen when it's travelers themselves are actively involved in the, the decision making and the policy making processes. No longer is it acceptable, except if it ever was acceptable, that second people felt they had a God given right to make decisions on our behalf. Yeah. And there was a tint of racism there because it was felt that we didn't have the capacity mm-hmm. as a yeah. people to analyze, reflect, and make decisions of our own lives. So there was, a, there was some racism involved in that as well. And even from well-intentioned people, well-intentioned people, they were still racist. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's a hard to say that. But John as I said, was, like me, well, he was pioneering. He set up Dublin Travelers Education and Development Group, as I say, now Pavy Point Travel and Mobile Centre. So he spoke about leadership, participation, and he also, along with others, promoted the whole concept of culture and rights. And the right to one's language, the right to one's ethnicity, the right to one's, you know, um, sense of who you are, and nobody having the right to challenge or take that away from you. And as I said then a few months ago, he also framed the travel issues away from poverty, destitution, or subculture of poverty into one of framing it as human rights issues. Uh, so what John was a priest, Mihal obviously was a priest. And I think that's really important. I think their work and their primary analysis. Around social justice, equality, and human rights. In some of it, mitigate some of the damage that was done with the Catholic Church, who did work hand in glove with the state. Mm-hmm. And in particular, you know, Bishop Charles McQuaid, mm-hmm. you know, I basically to go back to the Hall's terminology, ethnic cleansing. Mm-hmm. So that's what the state did. The state and the Catholic Church worked hand in glove around that analysis. Essentially, assimilation slash ethnic cleansing. But here we have two priests, you know, um, two Catholic priests, um, who, through their analysis and their commitment to social justice and human rights, I think did mitigate, mitigate, mitigate some of the the untold damage that was done uh, by the Catholic Church. Um, where we are now at the moment. I think we're in a very dangerous time. And I think we're all wondering what Michal would make 
of the context in which we find ourselves in. And you know, I think uh, Dave will speak more about this in terms of the rise of the far life and the peddling of you know the ideo ideology of racism and hate, division, fear, scaremongering, blaming immigrants for all the ills of society. Uh, it's really dangerous. Um, and I uh, and uh, I think I think among many of the concerns, I think the local European elections coming up, I believe, will probably be the most toxic racist elections we've ever had, I think. Now, we know we've had them before, and we've had politicians come out, you know, candidates uh, seeking election, or seeking re-election, uh, sitting councillors, sitting TDs, and even ministers come out with racist comments about Trump. Yep. We've seen that. We've seen only a short couple of years ago, we had a, a government minister actually responsible for housing policy in this country issue a letter to his constituency, and Kelly said, I am glad to inform you that no housing site will be getting built in the area. Yeah. Now, this was a minister for housing mm -hmm. who didn't subsequently not have become a commissioner. Mm -hmm. uh, so, this raises them. I, I think we need to be very careful and very cognizant that when we talk about racism, that we just don't take of the far right. Of course, we have to. We have to be concerned about it. But we also have to be concerned about uh, what the world is. Mainstream racism, if I call it that. People in, in high office, you know, people in the judiciary, people in the media who perpetuate and normalize the racism towards average. So it's important we don't lose uh, those side of that. And I, and I think it's really important that, that there is solidarity uh, between a whole range of people in this context and probably my own community, Traver. Immigrants, refugees, and other people who are vulnerable and who are exposed to racism and persecution. And I am really worried because I actually do see the moment soon something of some travel being actually manipulated and being exploited by the farmer. Mm -hmm. And I do know some of what he did take part in the riots on November 24. And you know, Paddy Point and other tribal groups are trying to respond to that and you know, um, that, that exploitation, um, you know, and it's, it's kind of a false narrative, you know, we're all Irish sort of, you know, we need to look after our own. You, we, uh, you're all very familiar with this sort of uh, language. But I, I'm just saying that, you know, we are very, very much cognizant of, of, of these trends and, and these developments. And we will be working with, with Hope Courage and Collective, Hope Collective and Courage. Yeah. <laughs> Right that, that racist ideology, that narrative, and the potential for manipulation and exp exploitation of other groups, not just members, but working class, disadvantaged, marginalized communities. And that's essentially what happened on the 23rd. It was about vulnerable, uh, disadvantaged communities being manipulated by, by the far right. So they just uh, uh, finished with the in this case, maybe the two degrees of separation. But mm -hmm. I think Tony says uh, that uh, Mihal's mother or father was a con. And a kind, or kind from, from Ma, the Ma area. Ma area, yeah. Ma main. Ma main, between Ma main yeah, and yeah. Ma cross. Yeah. yeah. Because another connection actually was uh, John O'Connor, who's from Clareborn, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very devout Catholic, very religious as well. And he would have organized along with others a number of uh, traveler uh, pilgrimages. And one of them was actually to the moment. And uh, so I just, so just reinforcing that notion of uh, maybe to a bit of separation sort of thing. So I just want to finish off by saying that, uh, you know, um, uh, just again to acknowledge uh, uh, Michal's uh, research, his, his working, his, uh, his writings, his publications, and uh, it was of a invaluable, really, to the work of, of, of travel organizations because our analysis eventually converged. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. But I have any questions.
Yeah, good afternoon, but still good morning. So good morning, folks. My name is Neen McDonald. I'm the director of the Hope Courage Collective. It's a privilege to be here today. Um, I was a student here. I was doing my degree kind of during the pandemic. I haven't really been back. So it's kind of strange. So this is the way that I'm back, but it's a real it's a real honor to be here today. And I see some people that I would have kind of been in lectures, but more importantly, I see a lot of people in the room that I've worked with on the Hope and Courage Collective. A lot of people who are actually facing the gauntlet of the far right responding in between both community workers in the back. So if you're privileged to be in the room with you guys today, and I hope you feed back from what I'm going to present here today. I'm like the merchant of doom coming into rooms, folks, so just to set, just to set, the, set the tone. I'm going to here to talk about hate and extremism. But something I really, really, really want to land with you today is to understand like kind of the, how hate and extremism is coming together. How do we describe the far right? Because there isn't really a, a kind of proper understanding. And this is coming from our work at the Hope and Courage Collective. I'm not saying it's academia or anything like that, but this is how we have a functional description of, of the far right and then their playbook, right? And we talk about that. Language is a huge part of that. We've heard when Martin talks about particular people are talked about to other them. So the massive tool that the far right use. And then we kind of want to talk about also kind of the cycle of hate and what you're in and the elections. It's very good. But we can also see right now since January 2024, the appeasement by this government to the far right for young men who are seeking asylum are left to sleep on the snow. All right. Mm-hmm. So we can see that. So I think mean, we don't have to. So it, it's happened already. And this is involving the far right. So I just so we kind of go between the term far right or hate and division because sometimes they like to are able to weaponize things like far right, they kind of weaponize racism and stuff. So I think sometimes describing it more so than giving it a label is much more helpful and it stops them kind of weaponizing it on us. So as Martin rightly said, before we get to the far right, we have to understand the cultural, structural, and institutional racism, oppression, and think that is in Ireland and is continuing in Ireland and is actually accelerating and deepening. We can see increases of racism, increases of kind of LGBT attacks, and that you wouldn't put in the bubble of the far right. Let's put it that way. But some people are being emboldened by the everyday of that. So we can't separate that at all. And Martin is really, really good to, to point that out. That's something that we should be able to kind of acknowledge that not every, not all hatred is far right. Put it that way. And it is us. Hatred is us. Racism is us. There is nothing that's been separate. There is nothing as Irish exceptionalism. It is us. So we have to acknowledge that. So understanding the far right. So this is kind of our thing about we kind of look at the kind of three legs of the stool when we're describing them. Do you know what I mean? And understanding. And also it's kind of really like people today like to talk about who they are, the individuals, so-called citizen journalists, and who's this one, who's that one, who's the other one. That's a distraction. It's a complete distraction. Because if you're looking at one in front of you, you will not see the one behind coming behind you, mm-hmm. right? Or coming from this end or coming from that end. So we just really, if we understand why they're doing this and how they're doing this, it's much more useful. There are very words about maybe so-called independent candidates in the local elections, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think if we understand how they're operating, it's much easier to, to, to respond. So the first thing I talk about Christian fundamentalism, that runs through the whole entire of the Irish virus, all right? This is kind of LGBTQ hate, anti-choice, sex ed reform, and anti-Semitism. And that's massively on the increase. Okay, and then we're kind of talking about kind of the anti-science. It's kind of anti-vax, climate denial, kind of uh, anti lockdown Now, I'm not saying that if you're kind of, you don't want to get vaccinated, or you're kind of, you were done for the COVID restrictions, that you're far right. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, this is a place where conspiracies grow, and it's a place where the far right populate and recruit strong. So we have to be very clear around that. And then the ethno-nationalism, which is the Islamophobia, the white supremacy, the anti-Sidem and the refugee. So, you know, this ethno-nationalism, you have to be kind of white, settled and Catholic to be Irish. That's what they're doing, right? And they're also kind of taking the flag. The Irish flag, which would have been seen one as one of kind of, you know, freedom of rebellion, of, 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 of you know, of breaking away. Now it's becoming a, quite a reactionary, which is very shameful. Do you know what I mean? That's something that we need to hold back. So even county colours, you're coming to these kind of um, anti-racist, but you're county colours. So they're weaponizing all of these terms that we would use, you know, for themselves. It's not an anti-racist demo, but like I would be worried that in an Irish flag outside the house. What does that mean? So that, do you know what I mean? So I just these are the kind of changes that we're kind of starting to see. So these are some of the organizations you'll see in your ballot when you're going to take boxes on your ballot on your base. So this is the National Party is down here. They go to bed as fascists and wake up fascists. There's no if <laughs> babies about them, okay? Not to there. They were born in 2016, came out from a very uh, kind of militant, reactionary, kind of anti-choice movement. 
I think lunch, folks, sorry, <laughs> it helps in this scenario to kind of explaining things. So to be very straight, this is the Irish Freedom Party. This was born from like um, Nigel Farage and Brexit. So the leader of that party would be, he would have been kind of Farage as the head of communications in EU at the time. They are now coming to very kind of, you know, white supremacist. Initially, kind of astroturfy, but are starting to dig into the communities now through the the, and the asylum protest, the anti immigrant and anti asylum protest. They're starting to dig in. This year, our first white supremacist organization, basically in Cork, and registered in March 2023. It's grown a bit now, it's in Wexford, kind of Wicklow, near where I'm from, originally, and in Cork. So it's grown legs quite, quite fast, too. But I think the local elections, as Martin did raise, I'm not sure how much these will get, but what they do is they'll drive the Overton window, what's acceptable in Irish politics, over. And that will create maybe space for independence, Fianna Fáilers, Fianna Gaelers, and let's call it Sinn Féin as well, to go in that direction. All right? So this is something that we have to be very aware of. We've already seen a shift in the Overton window in Ireland, and it's going to keep going that way. So it's, so we have to, um, so the elections will drag it. So these are the ones I'm more worried about. To be honest with you, the hate influencers. You know, you're on Instagram and someone's selling you stuff and all that, and you know, you're being, someone's influencing you to buy stuff. These are fascist and hate influencers. Okay. These move much faster than the political parties do. Political parties have to move slower, as we all know, but these move much faster. These are the ones that are spreading the disinformation or ripping up the fear. Let's take Selbridge. People are aware of what happened yeah. in Selbridge maybe 10 days ago. Okay. One influencer in particular. Very well known, they're very networked. So one thing that's in particular on the Monday, I think it was Monday night at 11 pm, put up a post of that disgusting, claiming something savage happened in the centre of a place where nothing ever happened before. 36 hours later, after this going fast across Twitter and all other places, there was a baying mob outside that centre, threatening violence to people who lived in Germany within that centre. Surrounding that, people coming home to get into the centre to get in. They had to hide in bushes in local council estates. People from different um, uh, cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, trying to get home in the cars. They were attacked. People of colour driving their cars home were attacked, or people who seemed to be not like, like Irish were attacked. And people supporting any of those people were also threatened. And the, when the local groups on the ground asked the police, they said, Oh, we were unaware of anything for this. We didn't know what was going on, and had no safety operation in place for anything of what happened. This all started because one influencer sent out a very nasty disinformation on social media and went fast, very, very fast. So these guys moved very, very fast. I said there's 40 to 50 hate influencers, overwhelmingly male. It's constant monetized content production. They are doing this, they get money from this, the fibers and from the county online. And that's how they're able to do this and travel around the country. But this constant content production is key as well as part of their playbook, which I'll go into. And they built an online base during COVID. That's where a lot of those kind of, um, they sharpened their teeth to start with during COVID and built up to understand the, how to use how to use social media as a route for disinformation. Well, how does disinformation land? You know? So it's very important that you kind of understand that. So there's a playbook. This is just from our work and what we say. This is a playbook. That the far I have, they create chaos, they create fear, they create violence, they create disgust. But there's a formula to how they do this. All right. Very interesting um, when they just have a formula. So, first of all, this can happen in a number of ways. That should be something but the emotions. This is really, really important. So the first tactic is used to engage kind of high intensity emotions of like anger, disgust, and fear. This is how they create the order within our communities okay and we can see that and those are tense emotions you know if you're upset or you're angry it's very tiring after but they need to sustain those emotions constantly right in order for hate and division to take hold to create that other that other could be a number of people it could be anyone that we can say it could be people seeking asylum with the traveler community lgbt it could be just people of color it could be trans people it depends anyone who's not white male catholic Irish, you're effectively you're up for, they're up for it. Do you know what I mean? And, and they will choose particular groups at particular times for their for what they need to do, you know. And this, and then rather, and then they scapegoat the other instead of looking at what the real solutions are. The fascists never come in with solutions, folks. They're coming in with hate and division and the other end, you know, and the distraction. 
with the framing and messaging. I'll get into a little bit of the language in a minute. But the framing and the shortcuts so of how they frame their message is very important. And they're very adept at using that. Maybe since um, uh, East Wall 2022, I see a familiar face in, in the room. And um, that's when that really messaging kind of started for is that Ireland is full. Ireland is full has trended on Twitter at least for every week since November 2022. And now it's become everyday language. It's used in the media. We can even hear ministers go, but Ireland's not full. So it's just repeated and it's repeated. So it started off trending on Twitter. Then it got into the mainstream and you can see it on RTE. You can see it on the front of the Times. You can see correspondents using it. So now, 18 months later, we're already accepting, like, is Ireland full? Ireland is full. It's full. We're not. We're not full. We're there. <laughs> Times you can see lots of energy build. We're definitely not full, okay? But then there's the word kind of unjust males, the men of military age. So these are used as concepts to give you an image in world of fear, but also they use this hyper local approach. This danger is at your front door. It's out your front door. You need to move fast. But if you don't, your house, your home, whatever it's going to be, your life as you currently know it will not be the same because these other people are coming into your community, yeah. right? So, and so yeah, so, yeah, so that's where the fear comes from. And then immobilization. So the mobilization is asking for people to collectively kind of take action. So we can see this in the form of marches, static protests, but increasingly since the mar since November, since the riots in November, and more militant activity such as play, um, blockades and arson attacks. There's been 23 arson attacks since 2018, since Mobile was the first one. But it's like the last 18 months, there's an increased intensity. And since November 23, we've seen an intensity of it, of it since then. You know what I mean? So, and a lot of these calls take action on social media. All of it takes action. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, too. I want to talk a little bit about the brief history of the dehumanizing language, because I think that's really fundamental. A lot of people struggle with understanding the language that they're using, you know? So we did a little bit of research about that kind of just in January, just with the team. And we were looking at that kind of military aged men and the, like, the men of fighting age and where did that come from? We first found that used by the US and the UK militaries, militaries mm -hmm. to dehumanize Muslim men, right, during the war on terror in, 19, in, in, in post 9 11 to justify the murder of thousands and thousands of people in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. That's what we saw. Then what we then said to do it in a more public context. It was used by um, in 2015 when people from Syria were fleeing war and they were coming to Britain. And we saw it being used then by Tommy Robinson, Inch Defence League, and the neo Nazi Right? That's where we saw that the, the last time. Then in Ireland, we kind of had a look back on it. And between kind of 2014 and 2021, eight times in the Irish context, 2022, less than 30 times. But then all of a sudden, in 2023, we've seen that like about 800 times, and now it's become normalised language. What we've seen from that now is the so-called military-aged men sleeping in the snow <laughs> in Dublin because the government won't house them because they're appeasing the farmers. And that's exactly what's happened, right? Because of the use of that language, and they've rolled back on policies. Okay? We have to see. So I'm just going to talk a little bit but the most recent activity, probably from November to, to January 24, just to give you a bit of a picture. So we saw November 2022, as I said, saw the East Wall. You don't see a bit of a pattern, the same pattern from last year to this year, which is kind of reassuring. There's a bit of a human element to it that they, they go up and they go down. Does that make sense? Which is, you know, it's some ways it's like, okay, if we wait one more year and we see, is that a pattern? And then we can say, actually, this is something that's, this is how they operate. But we're just learning as we're going. We're only a couple of steps ahead of everyone else. So we saw that really kind of scary kind of stuff in November 2022 that started off with East Wall. Then from March, it started to roll into LGBT, anti-LGBT. We started to talk about their language, started to show when they were talking about people seeking asylum, they were talking about LGBT and trans at the same time. So then we started to veer and dip into LGBT activity all across the summer. We saw that ridiculous thing up and going up and down the Shannon, do you know what I mean? And going into the libraries and threatening LGBT people and threatening librarians and workers and stuff. Yeah, the current, yeah, you know, and they're trying to do this around the, the referendum at the moment. Then we saw it kind of slip into schools around kind of sex education. And so that was more kind of, it was very unseen because it was kind of a, a leaflet campaign and an online campaign by very kind of respectable middle class looking women fascists, but let's call them what they were, but they were respectable. But they weren't the 
you know, the lads on the streets, do you know what I mean? So we do have respectable middle class bachelors as well, folks, just to say, do you know what I mean? You know, so, and they were the women who are like the connective tissue that look respectable and, and they kind of speak to, speak to kind of mothers and, and speak to those fears as well. So they come in all forms, I think, is, is the way I'd like to talk about it. Then we went back into anti-migrant activity again in October, and then we have the riots. And then since the riots, we've seen a more, that network of kind of influencers that I spoke about, that network has deepened, it's strengthened, and they're more coordinated. And they're more, and they are more violent. Violent in their language, violent in their approach, and violent is in burning buildings down. And also the blockades. We can all remember saw what happened in Ross Cray. You know, that, and that reminded us back to lots of real things that have happened in our country before, you know. So, and, um, and then, and we saw while numbers are reducing, we can see their tactics have adapted towards that to create the conflict that's needed mm-hmm. in communities, right? To deepen that. And now the election campaign has begun. And I'm going to say one more time that the role of independence is going to be critical in these elections because they're going to take up that language. And people won't see it. And they're like, oh, that's someone I know down the road. That's not that crazy person who's talking about all the conspiracy theories. So that it's that Overton window. But then we have to look at the role of social media, which is not always kind of talked about in relation to the far right. It's something we at the Hope and Courage Collective believe is extraordinarily important, is the role that social media has in facilitating and delivering the language, the hate and the violence. Okay? So Telegram is kind of an unregulated space that they openly talk about their activities and so on. But more importantly now, Twitter has become that space as well, because what I would define, you know, Musk is a white supremacist and he's running that organisation. And he has, and there is no regulation there whatsoever. And uh, just to say, Ireland is now um, the home of the Digital Services Act, the European Digital Services Act. We have the HQ of all the building, of all those organisations in Dublin. So there's a massive role that the Irish kind of government of the Irish state will play in the regulation of social media. Something we at the Hope and Courage Collective have been for is to turn a thing called the recommender system off. To explain it in a very simple way, what the recommender system does is take all your sensitive data, your gender, your age, where you live, what you like, delivers that to the social media companies. They have a picture of you, and then they can turn around and go, oh, I know what salacious violent content I can put in that person's feed without you looking for it. And then suddenly you're in this algorithm and this river of hate, and you cannot get off. We all know, remember if you look for something on your social media page, hair dryer or hair dryer, so when you get ads for that constantly, that's the same thing that will happen to you being a river of hate. We are asking for that recommender system to be switched off. So you're putting them in the dam as such. And the Commissioner Mon, Neve Hodnett, has taken on that initial call in her first proposal. So I'm banging this drum everywhere I go, folks. <laughs> So, and if you're talking to Europeans, people for Europe, or you're talking to your next TDs or whatever it is, is that we need to do the regulation of social media. The takedown is too late. The damage is done. The hate is there. It's already there. Take it down. We need to go back a step and put down the dam. It's not only people from hate and extremism, but also the kids, our children who are using social media and are born online. So this it's very, very important. So I'll just give you kind of an idea of kind of some of the the role that social media has kind of played in, in hate and and continues to play. And we feel that, as much to put it simply, if it wasn't for social media, there'd be a bunch of people sitting in the pub having a fight. Yeah, yeah, put it that way. You know I mean? so otherwise, they have this big, massive platform. Now, the one other thing to say, they recommend a system being off doesn't prevent you from posting on social media, but the right to free speech doesn't give you the right to amplification. They're two different things, right? So you can say what you want on social media, but you don't have a right to be amplified to millions of people causing a hate of disinformation and damage, you know? Yeah. So suppose I just want to just uh, one more two slide and then I'll finish. So this is kind of where this is a cycle that I just kind of like to show you. And we're experiencing a lot of this right now. So we're kind of seeing like the rise of hate politics in Ireland. Do you know what I mean? So maybe I start down with kind of disinformation and hate speech as I talk about driven by the algorithms. We could see that at the start of the like I go back to November 2022 with the East Wall and the role that um, kind of Ireland is full, the military age men, we should all be scared. And that leads to the kind of isolation and exclusion. So people seeking asylum, LGBT, whatever people who are othered are now saying, I don't feel safe going outside. I don't think I want to go outside. I don't want to participate. Do you know what I mean? Because of that, 
and then polarized communities, kind of the creation of the other, the scapegoats. So you're getting very kind of serious divisions in communities, which is apparent. We can see that, you know. And then the motivated haters kind of have the mega the megaphone, the hate megaphone, the copycat tactics, the arsons, the blockades. Yeah. And you said the weaponizer of getting out and all the hate So we can see the copycat tactics, prevention issues are mobilized, politicized. So we can see they try to kind of politicize. The, uh, the referendum, they'll do that during the, the elections. And then we have the chill effect on mainstream politics. Mainstream politics, we can see that right now. We can see that get tough narrative. Even yesterday, it's been Gail signing up something in Europe to, like, to start to send people seeking asylum off to Rwanda. I'm not sure what they, they wanted to send them to Rwanda. So we can see that this is having a massive effect. And reactionary narratives, the get tough, and the policies, again, I really want to straighten that up for those men sleeping on the snow in Dublin, and there was nothing that we wanted to do for them. A young man, I think he was 18 or 19 from Nigeria, having frostbite on his toes because he didn't have any shoes. They came back on, on Monday, no tents provided, nothing for them, and no response from this government. It was it, it's horrific. And then the media and public debate, we've seen in the polls, what's top in the polls now that wasn't top in the polls before? Immigration. Immigration, immigration, immigration. They've had a massive success, folks, without even getting elected. And we have to acknowledge that in the room right now. And then a positive. <laughs> so I tried to come back with a little bit of positive. So where do we need to get to? It's really, really important that we want to break the cycle. Do you know what I mean? So we want to go, like, so the decline in, if I go back to hate speech, decline in hate and disinformation. And that is the role of regulation of social media companies. It is vital. What we do now. This is like tobacco companies, the oil companies, a long, long time ago. That's kind of where we're at. <coughs> the community solidarity. Again, I see a lot of community workers here in the room who are generating that kind of solidarity. And we're going in day in and day out, building that solidarity on the ground, having those one-to-one -one conversations. There's people here from Galway, there's people here from Donegal, there's people here from Wexford that I've worked with and doing an amazing work. The trust in institutions, political and civil. This is a political response to the increasing, uh, I suppose, you know, um, the increasing in inequality that we've seen, especially since the crash of 2008, let's call it what it is, the housing crisis, healthcare, the lack of trust that's there, and the contradiction that we're taking in billions, but there's people hungry on the ground. You can't blame this on the recession anymore. It could, you know, but that's not there. Engage problem solving, having proper uh, proactive engagement for communities on the ground, community leadership on the ground. So we've two years into this, into the Ukraine war. There is no excuse from this government that they, that they shouldn't be engaging with communities across the country to have a proactive stance when people are coming into their communities. That excuse is gone. And they are not playing a whole governmental approach, brave political leadership. There's a few standing up in the doll, there's a few standing up in our communities. We need to be pushing them to do it again. And the regrets and progressive policy outcomes and the narrative. The narrative is key. The far right take control of the narrative and they seem to be the only ones talking and it reduces other people from talking. We have developed a particular race, class, gender kind of narrative on how to respond to the far right. And that's something we're actually message testing. Um, the far right's narrative, uh, Sinn Féin's narrative and an NGO narrative. We're message testing that on 3,000 people across the country, battle testing it at the moment. We'll have that um, information in a few weeks and we'll see whose message is actually winning across the country and we'll have the, the response of that in a few weeks. So the narrative is very, very important. And then the informed public discussion, the informed versus the weaponized, way, the weaponized our issues, we have to steer it away from that. So folks, um, I'll leave it at that and then I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much. And I can speak for that. And just take a few comments from the So, Jamie and then Sierra. Thanks for that. That's, that's by far the best presentation I've seen on the far right by, by far. I would just kind of underline a couple of things that most of those folks that you're looking at, I've done a little work on this, and there are people who have done Most of those folks you're looking at actually have a previous history on Reddit. 
the various kind of uh, Borkan. Yeah. You know, um, there's a very good, very young researcher uh, named uh, Josh Malloy. Okay. He's doing his uh, exec Irish Army. He's doing his uh, CFP, SEIP. And he's done really good work on that. And one of the abuse terms before, like, the, the basically before the lockdowns yeah. was, you know, if you were pro immigration, you were a global homo. You know, so I, I mean, so, so I, that that kind of those things you have separate, you know, at the beginning, that that first slide, I've really been superimposed on one another since as near as I can figure out about 2013, when you start to see the the successful algorithmic kind of ways of making money, particularly on YouTube. So that that's just one. In the American case, there's a woman named uh, Baloo who has a book called Reading the War at Home on the importance of female leadership in white nationalism and Christo fascism. And I agree with you that that's right on the on the edge there. So um, but yeah, both of those that there's there's some really interesting stuff in this in anthropology uh in, in Europe right now that's working on, on this topic. And uh, um, you know, your work there is absolutely invaluable. Also, Martin, one brief thing, Judith Oakley is actually sorry. Yeah, Judith Oakley yeah. is actually an anthropologist. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. helped my publisher a couple of like, yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> No, no, it's important, it's important to correct that. But it's also correct to say that people leave without ignorance. Well, yeah, no, she, 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 she's extremely yeah. funny about yeah. that. Yeah. And she's a very good writer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Um, I just want to say two things. Um, my name is Kira Bradley, I'm from the Social City, and, and I'm also on the Social Justice uh, Committee. So I just want to say thank you to Mary and our colleagues for organising this. Um, and what we've heard through the various presentations, um, different reflections on what Manute has done over the years. And, and I think it's fair to say that Manute has always, uh, some of the teams within Manute have really embraced the ideas around social justice, equality, human rights. And worked hard in many ways across many different departments. And uh, Martin, you're a victim of the of the um, the turf wars, I suppose, whether it's sociology or anthropology, and uh, <laughs> it requires a lot of the work of applied social studies. And you know, many of us are doing work that's overlapping, and 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 we share, but we share this space of Minif, and I think there are core values in Minif. Uh, that many of us hold around this kind of work. And in, I suppose I just want to recognise Social Justice Week uh, and all the work that's happening across the university, which showcases this work so well. Um, and I suppose so many people also in the room that we are a community of solidarity and that we may continue to stand with each other in the changes we face here in the right now uh, and in the broader um, society in, in Ireland and that, that we continue to hold those values dear and strive to work for them. Um, and the other second piece was a bit related to that and it's related to the, the reflection that Martin made about research and how research is not value neutral and can never be in the social sciences because we come as humans to it with all of the ways in which we were socialised in the world. And sometimes we are uh, can be reflective about that, but there's mm -hmm. always also the things that are not so clear in our own view about ourselves. So I want to also say, you know, for us as researchers, um, that we must continue to strive to be reflective and reflexive in our research and um, not to do any promoting of our, ourselves, but we launched mm -hmm. a book yesterday, Writing Social Justice and Research. Wow. Yeah. And it will be open yeah. next year also, yeah. but to actually promote the work that's in it, um, because there's many chapters within it which tackle some of those more complex, mm -hmm. um, I suppose, ideas around how we can do research in a way that's not value free and not neutral, but also has integrity and work and validity as research uh, for making society a better place. Uh, and I urge us all to do that in our in our mm. research and not to fool ourselves in thinking that we're in some way can be objective and stand back and look at the social world in which we are not part of, we are part of it, and damage has been done to various communities yeah. by not taking that reflective. Yeah. But we can also make a difference too, and that's where the hope piece comes in. Uh, and it's great to see me here mm. ending on that note, you know, and as a graduate of, of, of our department, that we uh, can take action and, and so just to tie the two pieces together, Social Justice Week has always been about a call to action. 
Mm. We have more power than we think in our different spaces and let me mm. act uh, with, with just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, just respond to the, the care of mind. Uh, well, well, actually, something that maybe a bit more related, but still relevant, and then I'll come back and about the research. Um, there was a, there's a French academic, I don't know if he's a sociologist or an anthropologist. <laughs> And his name is Liege. He has written extensively on uh, European gypsies and a little bit on travels. Uh, and he said about education uh, for, for gypsies and, and Roman travelers that the paradox is, and we're, I think this context is quite relevant in the news and the number of travelers have come through, which is fantastic, and we need to see more uh, in a whole range of disciplines um, you know, as well. And he said the paradox is that. Uh, Roman gypsy and travellers have had to go into the house of the oppressor exactly. to acquire the skills to fight the, the very oppression yeah. that they're experiencing. And that's what's actually happening. So the, not just here in, in Manu, but given that we are here, it is important to acknowledge the number of travellers who have come through here who have gone back out into the community are involved in travel organisations and are fighting that oppression. So the skills, the learning that they have acquired here is being applied to the, to the struggle. Okay, So that's a really important point, I think, to make. And then the, the bit about the research, I, I think there is a, there are issues there, and I think they're more prominent. I think, and the risk the risk of getting it wrong or greater when it's done by an outsider, right? But I think there's also an issue, and we're not quite there yet. And we're, we're, we're beginning to, to, to make strides where travelers are beginning beginning to write our own stuff, right? And have control, an element of control over it uh, and all the rest of it. And that's important. But that's not risk free either. But we could fuck up too. You know, like there has been bits and pieces written here and there where some travel would agree with it, other travel would disagree with it. And that's okay. But I suppose the fundamental point here is we're not quite at the races yet where we, where we are doing that in, in much more, what's the word? Frequently and, and, and larger volumes. That's the point they make it. But the point they make it here is that we too can get it wrong. But we just didn't have the opportunity really yeah. to get it wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Anyone else want to say anything about search? Just to point out that actually, if you are returning to your 1966 volume, whatever it is, prejudice and tolerance, me hall as an extended discussion on value neutrality and this very thing. So um, I might not necessarily agree with everything he says, Kevin. Okay, I'm just going to take John and then you're back. Yeah. Well, can I say thanks to all of you? I didn't know me all, but I learned so much there. It's really wonderful. So thanks very much indeed. So I have just one comment and question very quickly. Uh, to me, I just had uh, four days in Brussels last few days. I'm terrified by what went into my world. Uh, you mentioned the EPP Congress, uh, where they are clearly gravitating further and further to the right. Uh, Giorgio Maloney, the Italian Prime Minister, yeah. has been completely normalized over the last few yeah. years as a conventional conservative leader, and she's anything but that. Yes. And there's whatever realignment could take place is really, really worrying. So, whatever people can do and whatever they do in their communities. Very important before the 7th of June, I would say. Yeah. Farag is only first in nine out of 27 jurisdictions, including in France, in Austria, and elsewhere, and second or third in another nine. We've never had this situation yeah. ever before. Um, changing tax slightly, but just for Tony, I was just interested in Mihal and what he thought about the decline in the esteem in which the church was held, say, from the early 1990s, as the scandals kind of accumulated, and where somebody, you know, his faith was still, of course, deeply important to him. How did people like him kind of react to all of that? And how did they adjust to it in their, their own kind of conception of the church and be a member of the church? Thanks, it was fascinating yeah. to listen to my rap. Well, he was expressing concern about the time long before any scandals emerged. I mean, scandals emerged in the middle of the 1990s. Yeah. And uh, 
what I think of as this secularization, the way people approach ethical questions, was already almost 100% completed by then. In other words, divine reference, any kind of evangelical or theological basis for moral argument in Ireland was gone. Even the bishops themselves, the bishops, uh, are many Catholics resisted the gender revolution, the secular and the, and the, the, the sexual revolution. But increasingly, from the 1970s onwards, they did it on sociological, uh, sort of secular basis. They said, this is bad for society. And, and in fact, I think Irish Catholicism is, I know you, uh, you mentioned this Christian fundamentalism, mm -hmm. but I think Ireland is very unusual. And, and I think it's one of the puzzles that strikes me is that for a country that came from such an intense Catholic background in the 1950s, by the beginning of the present century, there was no Catholic party now. There was no Catholic, there was no TD in the Dáil who stood up and said, I am a Christian nationalist. Uh, and whereas nearly every other country, there may be a minority. Uh, and there's, of course, a lot of political, lots of countries where there's a lot of Catholics in the parliament. But it's become increasingly rare in most democracies for Catholics to defend issues on the Catholic, traditional Catholic basis. And Ireland was, I, I saw a, a, a graph in The Economist there about two months ago. It said that Ireland, Iceland, Malta, and Lithuania were the only uh, jurisdictions in Europe where less than 1% of the population in opinion polls and any voting, but it, it was, the numbers were still less than 1% of the population. Whereas and, and the survey you quoted there recently is showing a very dramatically different picture in much of Europe. In other words, if we were a normal ex Catholic country, we'd have 20 or 30 TDs in the Dáil who are explicitly advocating the kinds of things that Neve is talking about in, uh, here as you know, fringe people whose names we generally don't know. They'd be elected already and in you know, Nigel Farage types or Maloney types, they would be in the Dáil by now. Now, they may get into, not the Dáil, we don't have Dáil elections this summer, but they may at least get into county councils and uh, into uh, the European Parliament. But it's, 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 it just puzzles me as to why we, we didn't arrive here, going by patterns elsewhere in Europe, why, didn't we, we, why did we not arrive here I, 20 years ago? I, I think there's like historical reasons for that. I think if you go back to the, the emergence of the state, no, so we've never had a proper right left. Like, you know, yeah. Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil and all those, they have, they are Catholic. We've never had to have the separation. Mm -hmm. Our state has been built off the, the Catholicism, like, you know, like McQuaid and everything that you've talked about. And now, and also we didn't have that golden age of capitalism post-war. We were always, there was an internal looking. So we didn't have that kind of left-right divide. Now Sinn Féin is taking that space as a left-right. I would argue very against them being a holy left party. They were broad church. I think they're teenagers of Fianna Fáil, personally. Yeah, so, so um, you go back. Well, well, yeah, they're, they're, I'm sure that rebellious phase ends very early. Yeah. And when, when, they, when they get power. And, and So I can see, and it, but in working-class communities and in other areas, they would see as a left, that left-right divide, and that's coming. But also we have to look at the marriage referendum, and the right to choose the two referendums, 30% of the population voted against that. And they feel they have no home because all of the mainstream parties took that on board. So there's been a realignment of our politics and of our economics over the last 20 years that's creating that space. Why we didn't have far right up to now, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael sucked that all up. They all like single mum that I would be in 40 years, I'd be locked up, LGBT, all of that. That was already dominated. So there was no space for those reactionary parties because it was already there. Thank you. So, do you want to say your name? Yeah. So, um, I'm a good nomad. Nomad is nomadic person. is very big I, for my identity. So, it's very nice to hear that there is also a nomadic person who is talking about and acknowledging the whole division between our community and, and from outside the community. So, in the post of nomadism in life. So, I, I really do hope that when I say that my name is Handa, you know, what a nomad, a migrant person, they really and I will think they get fascinated about my story. So then when I said that, oh, well, it's, you know, we, we share nomadism with our travelers, though, conversation lines. <laughs> so um, I really think that there will be conversation with the uh, knowledge after I say that mm -hmm. one day. And also, and 
me as a nomad person, I could, I get welcomed by Irish travelers. Query that because I'm a nomad person, I'm outsider. So then also, I do lots of activism in the nomad community. I recognize that uh, as a community leader, community activist, I have a huge, um, unique position to influence and mobilize both communities to get together, get along with the idea, oh my goodness, let's talk about our this, those things mm -hmm. that we are divided about. <clears throat> so that's why hope and courage is really important. That's why um Martin, you are very relevant to all the community leaders that are talking about okay, I can imagine some researchers that really have good loss. Especially European wide research, we need to have a response in different cities all around the world. So, thanks for acknowledging that. And also, thanks for saying that there are nice species of people are acknowledging that we have a problem to exist. We know this, we know this, and we are allowed to exist in Ireland. Why do you have your nomadism? Why do you get fascinated about my nomadism? It's a simple thing. Okay, let's go. We have to go to the Thank you. Okay, I'll move that. I can cook it for everybody. Again, go back to the theme of Nepal, that oscillators call himself a Christian communist. I'm conscious of the in space that he was talking about. That there is a significant percentage, let's call it 20%, yeah. that will actually move them over. Yeah. Right? Let's put all of that. Give me four different answers this. Do you think that the way that the legal would suggest that sober that takes the drama out of it, that can provide a kind of a, a space or a way for them to move out of that? <laughs> But yet, still hold their value system. In other words, that they can operate as instances of that pluralism. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a, there's a massive opportunity for the Catholic Church to drive a wedge between the Christian fundamentalism and that 30%. I talk to a lot of people in the Catholic Church and talked about this. I think we need to separate them out because they're weaponizing Catholicism. I'm not religious, but my parents, they're weaponizing it, right? And they're using it in a particular way. So I think there's a role for the Catholic Church and leadership within that to play a very positive role. But I'm going believing in everything, but to drive that way so they can be very isolated. We need to isolate from the mental this part right now. Sorry. Yeah, I think a lot of the, I, I've seen some political science in Europe talk about Christianism, mm -hmm. which are people who wave a, a, flag, a flag of Christian identity but who never darken the door of the church. In other words, they wouldn't play a bind. They wouldn't know a yeah. priest or a, a, they have no interest in religion, mm -hmm. but they use it simply as a flag of identity. I mean, the, the, the best case is Vladimir Putin, who says he's a defender of the Christian heritage of Europe against Western decadence. And so that kind of Christianism, and I don't think really that the, the church really wouldn't. Uh, I, I suspect a lot of these people never go near a church. No, no. For my discussions with them up to now, they're they're quite scared and not sure what's going on, and they don't know who they are. Yeah, yeah, they're they're just a lack of understanding within the church of what's happening. Yeah. Uh, Sean, I think. I feel like people need to move on to yeah. just make it matter. I was just saying, one comment, like, Neil did not actually study travel, and I think that's really important. Like we studied the society and we had mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. And that was the slightly driving thing in the that he actually wasn't saying, oh, this is to understand that. That's up to you, you know. You know, you can do that or not do it. But he was saying, understand yourselves. Yeah. It is a prejudice society. Yeah. And everyone's like, we're different, blah, blah, blah. No, you know, and the fair play is like, we are not different. We are prejudiced. It's 1976, whatever. So I think that was a massive thing. It was a lesson for academics. You know, less about the groups that are oppressed and more about the actual groups that are oppressed. I started a footnote, which is, I think, the last round of the prejudice and tolerance. I think the two ways are actually available. They're, they're very similar in the Coastline State Archive. But the last one, I think, was the last survey that was ever done by the ESRI survey unit before it's always. 
And honestly, we didn't really want to do it. And they kind of did it basically because of being called with me and and they were kind of like, oh God. Yeah, Actually, can I ask a question about the Irish? It's an urban legend. I don't know if it's true. But when I first started marking scripts in Maynooth, the students would always write their names in Irish, which made, uh, you know, because they're registered in the English names, created all sorts of administrative problems. But the story I was told was that Michal McGrail gave you extra points. If you <laughs> Is there any truth to that? Does anyone know? I don't know. I think that might be done as a firm of action. I just want to thank everybody for coming out to know that you came early and stayed late. Um, it was it was really wonderful to have so much brilliant energy in the room. And I'm very grateful to Kira for the kind comments she made, but also to thank you, Kira, and the team who have put together Social Justice Week. And I have to say, as a, a long time Malibian, I feel incredibly proud of the graduates that we have produced and the intellectual caliber of them and the people that we partner with, um, Holly Point, etc. So thank you all very, very much. And I will probably be making it to attend some of the other events in Catholic Bar tomorrow and Westport on Saturday. So thanks again for your time.